conversation that um, Kate and I had prior to this was really talking about um, resilient leadership capacity. Um, because I think a lot of times we focus on being resilient, but what does it mean to be, um, have to develop that capacity and what that looks like? And so excited that Kate's joining us. I'm gonna have Kate introduce herself in a few minutes. Um, Kate's at Marquette and they just actually finished hosting two, right? In, uh, sessions of the Institute for, and I'm sure she'll mention that at some point, but very excited to have a, a, a wonderful campus partner with us um, as we move forward. Wanna um, begin by just doing a, a land acknowledgement and that is Leadership would like to begin this presentation by acknowledging that the land each of us is on today are the original homelands of many native and indigenous tribes. Um, we acknowledge the painful history of genocide and forced removal from these territories. And we honor and respect the many diverse indigenous people still connected to this land. Please honor and acknowledge the native and indigenous peoples from the land that you are joining us and give thought to your ancestry and the generations that came before you. I'm coming to you from Washington, DC, which is the ancestral homelands of many native and indigenous tribes, but primarily the Piscataway and the Anacostic. But now that I say that, I'm actually in a hotel in Baltimore, <laughs> which is actually yeah, about 20, about 45 minutes from my house, which is in the ancestral homelands of the Piscataway. So it kind of still fits. And so, but I really want to make sure that we, when we see land acknowledgements, that we take them in. This is about more than just a statement. It's about taking in the spirit of what it means to be on this land. Also too, I typically add now a uh, labor acknowledgement, which really looks at um, black and brown folk and um, API folk who have been a part of the fabric of our country since the beginning of time and, and have contributed to who we are as a world and who we are as a country. So um, for those of you that don't know us at Leadership, you know, our vision is a just, caring, and thriving world where all lead with integrity and a healthy disregard for the impossible. And our mission is to transform the world by increasing the number of people who lead with integrity and a healthy disregard for the impossible. If you Google leadership, you will probably find millions of hits on definitions of leadership at Leadership. We believe that leadership involves living in a state of possibility, making a commitment to a vision, developing relationships to move that vision into action, and sustaining a high level of integrity. Effective leadership takes place in the context of a community and results in a more equitable society. So enough of me. I'd love um, to bring Kate here to join us and say hello and welcome and introduce herself. And thank you so much, Kate, for being here and doing this for us. Vernon, thanks for such a lovely introduction. And as I start to share my screen here, um, just deeply grateful um, to each of you for making the time to join. Um, Vernon, I'm just gonna check in. Can you see my slides okay? Yep, perfect. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, so I come to you all from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, Vernon and I were chatting before you all joined. We just had our first significant round of snow, uh, nine inches at my house last weekend. And the cold that is making its way to the Northeast now uh, has been with us for the last couple of days. So um, but very here to have the opportunity um, to join you, I'm going to share a little bit about my background and context and connection to leadership. Um, I think sometimes that's helpful just so that we know who's here. As I look at this participant list, I see um, lots of names and faces that I have not had a chance to connect with before. So the beauty of being connected and partnered uh, through leadership is these wonderful, this wonderful community of leadership educators and lifelong learners that we're surrounded by. So um, I always like to say who I am before my job. Um, I am a wife and a mom of three girls um, who are on the background of my computer screen and make me smile every time I see them. Um, I love to coach soccer. Um, I've coached all three girls and I'm currently coaching one of them. Um, and I'm an advocate in the pediatric quality improvement healthcare space. Uh, I have a child who has uh, some pretty significant chronic, chronic medical conditions. And so that is a place that I practice leadership um, outside of my work and my role. 
Um, as I introduce myself, I would love in the chat to have you all introduce yourselves as well, maybe share, we can see your names, but maybe your title um, or the program that you work uh, with and the organization or institution that you are part of, just to help us build community and recognize who's in the room and, and the learners. So just to give you some context on, on my background, um, like I said, I'm, I'm here at Marquette. I am an alum of Marquette University, um, but I have kind of an interesting path of getting to this work in leadership education. I spent, I have a degree in accounting and finance and spent quite a bit of time um, as a financial analyst at a private multinational company based here in uh, Wisconsin. Um, and then decided, it's a very long story as many of ours are, but decided to pursue a master's degree in student affairs. I attended Loyola University of Chicago um, and I had two wonderful years of professional experience working with students there um, and some opportunities to connect in at DePaul University as well. Um, and I've been here at Marquette for 15 years, uh, seven of those in our division of student affairs in traditional activities roles. Um, and then uh, about, um, eight years ago, moved over to our College of Engineering, and I serve as the founding director of a three-year curricular innovation leadership development program. And I'm going to share a little bit more about that program and that context um, as we get into our time today. Um, but I've been connected with Leadership since 2014, 2015, um, that academic year. My colleague, Andrea, Gorm uh, Andrea gorman Minkley, she just got married. I'm not used to her new last name. Um, is uh, a great partner in helping uh, foster this partnership with Leadership. Um, but we've been part of eight institutes. And as Vernon mentioned in the beginning, we just hosted two concurrent sessions in January. Um, and what a feat that was, but really grateful to have had that opportunity. Um, some of the, the insights, the lessons, the challenges, the trends that you're gonna hear me talk about today are centered around um, kind of some of our interactions when we, when we are with students in those very deeply engaged uh, moments and experiences, not being able to um, host in-person sessions of the Institute was certainly a, a challenge being with, not being with our students, um, but really grateful again for that connection um, here uh, at, uh, at Marquette within the Institute. So grateful to see all of the hellos here in our chat um, and love to see the diversity of where folks are coming from. Um, and thank you for being here. My invitation here today is, as Vernon said, this is, um, this is an intimate group. So I actually don't mind if people come off mute, um, if you have a question or if you wanna pose something um, in the chat, I am gonna be asking um, several questions and prompting you to respond to several things in the chat. Um, what this conversation is, is, a, is my perspective as a practitioner. I am not a scholar. I try to ground most of my work um, in scholarship, um, but I am not a, a scholar. And so would love to use this as an opportunity for us to share our experiences um, and insights, because that is the purpose of this, is how do we um, collectively learn uh, from, from these moments. So welcome all. Just by way of background and context, uh, I said I'm, I'm at uh, Marquette University in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and we are primarily an undergraduate institution. We serve about uh, 7,600 undergraduate students um, and about 3,600 graduate students. Um, and so the work that we do, about 12,000 students, a, a mid-sized university um, located right in the heart of downtown Milwaukee. Um, lots of great opportunities for our students um, and some challenges in the near, um, near area and the community around around us. Um, my colleague, Ben Kriya Harker, provided kind of the introductory session um, here um, with some really good data that they gathered as part of the 2021 administration of the Multi-Institutional Study of Leadership. Ben was a colleague um, and associate director for the ELEAD program that I am the director for um, through the pandemic. And so we navigated a lot of um, trying to figure everything out, including learning how to use Zoom um, together for uh, student related programs. Um, but what some of what I'll talk about is, is um, how we were making meaning of what we now see in the data and the stories that we can better understand through the data um, that the MSL provided. So um, again, please feel free to interject, to chime in um, and share um, your observations, your experiences um, alongside mine. I told Vernon to interrupt him with any questions that he sees come through the chat as well. Um, you know, I think as, as we all have learned how necessary it is to pause and take a collective breath, I love the land acknowledgement as we start each of these programs because it calls to mind where we are, 
our physical place and who has been in those spaces and responsible for those spaces, who's been harmed in those spaces before us. Um, I just think we all bring so much when we land. I know many of you are maybe um, having lunch or have this going on in the background, but um, there's a lot happening in our world, uh, a lot of violence impacting individuals and communities, and there's a collective impact on all of us. Um, there's some really extreme weather in some parts of our country um, that people are, are um, weighted down by, but also busyness and personal responsibility challenges in our relationships, finances, health concerns and joys. So just an invitation, however you're arriving today, um, this is something you'll hear me talk about toward the end of our time today that we've started to do with our students is to just center ourselves in a collective breath um, and, and really feeling that breath in and breath out and our feet on the ground beneath us. Um, we are honored as leadership educators to and really privileged, I think, to accompany our students in this work on this journey of developing, not just as leaders, but as human beings, as good contributing members to society. And sometimes we need to pause, right? That's the, that metaphor um, during the pandemic that we heard so, so often of our own oxygen mask, right? And being able to put that on and remembering and honoring what we bring um, before we launch into whether it's content, curriculum, programming activities, and just to, to acknowledge our own humanity and that of the people around us. So I hope as you take a breath um, that you find yourself um, just centered and um, finding moments to think about what you're grateful for in the work that you do, the opportunities that we have. I'm gonna share a little bit about the program that I work with in the history of slides. This is the ugliest and worst slide, I promise you. I'm not gonna go through all of it, but what I have done is, is, is try to give you a sense of this undergraduate experience that, um, that we have here on our campus. What you'll see on the right hand of the slide is an invitation. I'd love to hear more about the programs um, that you all are working with. Are they curricular, co-curricular? Are they short-term, are they long-term? What are the populations of students that you serve? And as you all are putting that in the chat, I'll share a little bit more about what we do um, in our Excellence in Leadership program here at Marquette University. It is a people-focused innovation leadership program. It is a curricular program. So what you see over the course of this three-year experience is students take classes with us, um, but we get to know them really well. Our, uh, the, the experience that we kick off with is the Institute. And so we build community. I see Nick's got his camera on. Nick joined us in January with one of our sessions um, as a co-lead facilitator at the Institute, um, but just building that community. So when students show up in the classroom for deep conversation and learning about who they are, understanding what leadership is, um, how they effectively lead with others, and how they lead innovation, that they do that in the context of a community that is strong, that is thoughtful, that is vulnerable, that is engaged with one another and invested in one another. We have several workshops that are part of this experience. And one of the things I'd just love to point out, um, before the pandemic, we were doing a workshop around building resilience in the face of adversity. We partner with an external um, organization called Peak Learning, um, really thinking about um, how do you build individual resilience? Um, Brandon, gosh, you framed it so well in the beginning of this is that we often talk about that building of resilience, but we don't necessarily think about what is the capacity and how is our capacity for resilience tested, taxed, changed, um, particularly in this context of um, this worldwide pandemic that we have all um, been navigating. We have 40 students starting the program every year. They are selected in the uh, fall semester of their sophomore year and begin uh, in the spring semester of their sophomore year and then take courses with us um, across the rest of their experience. Um, we have students from all across the university that are, are part of this experience. So I mentioned I am, my team is housed and our center is housed within the College of Engineering, but our program is open to students from all across campus. We certainly have a large number of engineers that are part of, uh, the, the majority of the students in our program are engineers, but that interdisciplinary perspective that students from other majors bring is so critical to the work that we do. Just looking at uh, some of the um, notes here on what people do, 
trying to think of see here if I've gotten any new new notes about the programs that that people are working with. I'm seeing introductions here, but please feel free to share um, the work that you do, the students that you serve. It might help me contextualize some of um, the comments that I make here. As you think about entering uh, those comments into the chat, one of the things um, that I'd just love for us also to maybe think about, or maybe even if someone wants to come off mute and share a perspective or two on this, um, for just to explore this idea of why is it important for us to think about resilience in the context of leadership and our students as we, dare we say, emerge from this worldwide pandemic. Any thoughts? And feel free to either, um, you know, do the hand raise option or, um, you know, put something in the chat, whatever you'd like to do. We'll, we're, we're both monitoring the chat. So Kate's really good about it. I'm not good when I'm doing a facilitation. I, I cannot keep up with that. So I always have some. <laughs> it is um, a feat of multitasking for it sure. It really is. And I thought I was pretty good at multitasking, but <laughs> absolutely not. Nick, I see that you came off of mute. Did you have something that you wanted to share? Sure. Yeah, I think as folks are, are chiming in, you know, as I think about our students and, you know, my own progress in my life, they're major life events that aren't always great. And for a lot of our students, this is really first time living on our own. And so how do we navigate this now as an adult, um, knowing that, yeah, not only is it COVID, it could be a layoff, it could be, I think, like 9-11 was my, you know, major thing where, you know, security was everywhere um, for our students, you know, how does COVID impact them? Um, and can be that first real, hopefully first real, first 18 years were great, but um, life-shaping experience that times are tough, it's not easy, it's uncertain, which never sits well with us as humans, right? Like we, we want a lot of answers, um, but how do we carry on? How do we, you know, in the context of leadership, help motivate our team and keep things going moving forward? And and how else would you know unless, you know, someone helps you understand that? Um, so there's my two cents as, as I see stuff now trickling yeah. in. Nick, that's so great. Thank you so much. And Kelsey, I see you commenting. Yeah, like students have missed some of the skills and learning, right? And, and um, you know, we were we were with students, Nick, Nick and I, and, and my colleague, Andrea, who's on, on the call as well, a group of sophomores, um, you know, this January. Um, and the realization for me, I mean, it really kind of hit me, um, these students were juniors and seniors in high school and missed most of those really formational times um, in high school um, where they may have been interacting with, um, you know, with teachers and adults in a very different way as they were preparing to leave their homes, right, and, and to, um, to, to become more independent, right? Absolutely, things that are much easier to understand and learn in person how to engage in conversation with someone who's sitting next to you. Um, you know, certainly a challenge if only, the only way you've done that is virtually or in a chat. Sometimes using your voice and vocalizing that can, can be challenging. Processing grief, absolutely a huge challenge. And, and grief of maybe personal loss, but also experiences lost, um, moments and milestones lost, um, financial resources lost. So, so many layers to that grief. Um, and just the collective loss of, of two years of, um, of life, right? And in so many ways in those connections. Um, yeah, Abby, uh, returning to, to our work, right? Um, we have to remind ourselves why we do this work and, and for whom. And that is, that is that collective breath in the beginning and that pause and that gratitude for us to remember, right? That sometimes, um, gosh, we get to do this work, not we have to do this work. So, um, Bonnie, I'm, I'm seeing, uh, yeah, working directly with students on building those strategies and wellness. Thank you so much. Um, Kelsey, yeah, the assumptions that we have um, about our students, um, nothing's the same, right? And so our, those assumptions have changed. I'm going to talk a little bit about that as we get in here. So thanks for those of you um, that, that are contributing through the chat. More prompts and questions, so be ready. I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask them. Um, but, you know, just, just to ground us, I think, as we think about what is resilience, um, I'm a big person, like, how do we define the terms that we're using so that we're all on the same page with what we're talking about? Um, I loved this definition from the APA dictionary, um, the process and outcome of successfully adapting to difficult or challenging life experiences, especially through mental, emotional, and behavioral flexibility 
and adjustment to external and internal demands. There's like so much that goes into all of that, certainly. Um, but the other piece here that they talk about and this reminder, um, you know, and, and Vernon, this is that great distinction that you made in the beginning, this capacity, we can build it. And I think for many of us, Doing that has been part of the work that we've done, but how do we acknowledge um, when our starting point for that cultivation and practice might be different um, or, or depleted, right, for many of us in ways that, that it wasn't previously. So just giving, giving some context uh, there to our conversation today. So in our work, I kind of talked a little bit about our ELEAD program. So we have this benefit of seeing students across three years. So they join our program as sophomores and we see them through their senior year. Um, and so just wanted to share some observed trends. I think some of these will resonate um, with things that we saw come through the chat, Nick, things that you touched on um, and what you shared, um, and maybe some themes that have also emerged in some of the previous uh, webinars that have gone on connected to this context in the last week. Um, but I think just from these, again, these are our, our observed um, anecdotal things uh, from, from our area. Pre-COVID on our campus, uh, we had students from an involvement standpoint that were significantly involved. Um, we have more student organizations than we know what to do with. Um, and many of our students were very overcommitted and the, the stress levels that we um, often were managing with them and helping them think about were related to their overcommitment of the, the many um, uh, things that they were taking on. Um, the pandemic shifted that. <laughs> they had no commitments and a lot of time on their hands and at home. Um, and then today, um, this, this academic year, um, one of the things we're noticing, and I'd be curious um, if, if others are seeing this as well, but our students are actively resisting overcommitment. They're really thinking about, um, well, this is a great option for me, but I'm not sure that I want to invest my time in doing that. I'm worried that if I become overcommitted, that I'm just not going to be able to handle it. And thinking about adding things to their plate um, can increase anxiety. And so from a recruitment standpoint, to our organizations, our fraternities and sororities on campus, to our programming boards, to you know, curricular leadership programs, right? Just that commitment to something that may take more time. Um, we are noticing that that pretty significant shift. So interest in, in experiences and involvement on our campus and in our programs specifically have declined um, since the pandemic. So Nick, thanks for that comment, seeing that ring true and just would be curious if, um, yeah, Kelsey, I have a lot on my plate um, and they can list those things out. So um, yeah, and they're thinking a great deal about academics, right? That, that desire to be successful in the classroom and knowing what it takes to do that um, and not wanting to stretch their time a little bit uh, beyond what they think they can handle. There's much uh, kind of with thinking about finances, um, many students, and this is certainly generalizations, not, not all of our students, but we had a lot of students that particularly particularly in our engineering cohorts, um, we're working for experience, internship, co-op experience that would be part of their resume builders, preparing them for work after college, um, a lot of spending money, um, you know, for some students is contributing to tuition, um, but we weren't seeing that as much pre-COVID. Um, in the pandemic, helping students navigate a loss of employment um, or really dissatisfying, disengaged remote work um, and the emotions and, and relationships that, that they were mourning um, that did not materialize in those remote contexts. Um, and now what we're seeing, we have a lot more students that are working uh, for tuition and school support. Um, we have a lot of students that are graduating early, and I would be curious to know if this is something that's happening on other campuses, but we, the number of students that are graduating a semester or a year early, their academics, they're building, you know, taking 20, 22, 23 credits a semester and really building that academic load so that they can get through um, their, their time at the university much more quickly um, and save essentially the, the cost of, of a year of tuition. And so that has been, um, you, you can imagine for us in a three year program when we have students who are thinking about graduating early or you know they're in the program and then they decide to graduate early, um, you know, what, what that does, right? To overall levels of commitment. Thinking about peer support and connection, um, and this, I think uh, I saw someone comment on this um, in the chat, you know, before the pandemic on our campus, students had really strong networks with each other. They relied on each other. 
for how to navigate the institution, how to navigate challenge, difficult courses, um, how to navigate um, some of the challenges of, of student organization and leadership commitment and involvement. Um, and so that was really our student organizations did a lot in driving those really positive connections. And I'm really speaking more across years in school, right? So our seniors doing a lot of mentoring with our sophomores and freshmen, them knowing who they are and people seeking out um, those experiences um, because they had a, a connection with someone who was um, a couple years older and had a, a really positive experience. The pandemic, as we know, certainly took the, a lot of that connection away. And as we have students returning to campus, um, what we're seeing is that significantly disrupted connection, right? So that mentorship that we saw from seniors to sophomores and freshmen, juniors to sophomores and freshmen, they just don't have relationship across the years on campus um, for those kinds of things to happen. So they know students from their virtual classes or from their in-person classes, but there really weren't a lot of activities happening on campus. So those relationships weren't formed um, and weren't there. So they're really um, also then as they think about stepping into these roles of rebuilding student organizations, they don't have a model for that kind of mentorship, for that kind of support, that kind of connection across the years. A really similar experience and interaction with faculty, staff, and other mentors on our campus. Um, those strong networks through student organizations, patterns of visiting office hours, that desire to connect with and learn from mentors was very strong on our campus, I think pre-COVID. Um, certainly disrupted, fragmented, virtual. And I don't know, you know, what we're hearing anecdotally from students is a lot of the help that they sought during the pandemic and, and they're, they're not faulting folks, but people just couldn't provide it, right? Because we were all navigating new, we were all navigating disruption, we were all navigating challenge, and we were all stretched much thinner um, than we had been. And so it's very interesting. And go back to that example of the sophomores that we have had with us um, in January at the Institute, um, much more of a hesitancy or an apprehension, maybe even a fear of interacting with um, adults, as they call us, we have to remind them that they are too, um, but folks who have, have more experience and, and that we might not be approachable um, or we might not uh, understand their experience. So um, sometimes even a perception of a lack of care or, or um, some of the anecdotes that we've, that we've heard, not really based in um, experience, but just based on well, why would they really care about me? Um, just because those patterns of, of students talking about that haven't been there. And then the last trend that I just wanna talk about this threshold for adversity. So um, we see this a lot in now in the classroom, um, particularly as assignments come due, as our students are um, you know, navigating a lot of things that are on their plate. Um, a lot of students previously think, not all, but many of them handled adversity pretty well. They could figure out a plan. Um, and one of the things that we're seeing now is that um, there's a, a shift, and I would say a decline, and this is reflected in the MSL data that Ben presented last week, um, in the kind of the threshold or bandwidth um, for what they can handle. Um, I think this goes hand in hand with that uh, fear of being overcommitted. Um, and it just seems like the things that previously might've been a little bit smaller that they could handle and navigate um, are now things that are causing them to say, you know what, I just don't think I can do this and stepping away from commitments and opportunities. And so I share all these trends, hopefully, um, uh, that these are things that maybe you're seeing or maybe you aren't, but, but from an anecdotal standpoint of things that we are noticing um, about students. And I think grounding this in um, and, and reminding us and bringing us back to what's, what's our context for the conversation today is that capacity for building resilience. And so if we have students who are, um, you know, they're maybe a little bit more concerned about finances. We have students who have maybe less of a social connection and a social fabric with other peers and colleagues on campus. Um, you know, that, that those things could be a, a pretty significant barrier for them to even step into opportunities, step into a place where we can then build um, that, that, uh, that, those resilient, uh, the skills for resiliency. I'm just going to pause there. If anyone has a, a question, comment, something that they, an observation that they want to chime in with, either in the chat um, or again, I'm totally fine if people come off mute um, to do that. I don't know if there's any any other observed trends or things people might add. 
Okay, one of the things that I was thinking, first of all, I love this slide. People who know me are like, know that I would like freak out. This is perfect. I'd love this slide so much, so much. Um, Thank I'm, you. Really thinking, <laughs> I'm really thinking about the peer support connection. I remember in, a, in one of the sessions we had earlier, um, someone mentioned, which I hadn't even thought about, and that was returning RAs. The fact that you don't have any returning RAs. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's no opportunity for mentorship or officer transition. Right, um, right. Because there's this, there's this sort of time where there wasn't anyone. Mm -hmm. And so how do you sort of navigate that um, in terms of student leadership? So that was one of the things I was thinking about as you talked about the peer support column. Yeah, and I think in many ways, in some of my conversations with leaders of student organizations, they don't even realize that they're rebuilding. They haven't named it as rebuilding in their organizations. And so um, just sometimes being able to name, like you don't have to have it all figured out and there's people here to help you um, as part of that. Kristen, I see your hand raised. Thanks. I, you know, I was, I was really thinking about what you mentioned, Kate, about students graduating early and how that really changes the trajectory of their involvement, kind of building on what Vernon said, right? If, if my whole goal is to kind of get out of my college experience as fast as possible and focus on the academics, then I don't, you know, consider all of those other pieces in terms of involvement. And I, I think that's something I haven't heard people talking about very much as I think about what has impacted involvement on campus. And it is the student's graduation and what does that timeline look like for them? I know in our work, I've just assumed, I've worked under the assumption that students are graduating in four to a little over four years and not the other way of three to four years. That really shifts the, my mindset of how do we reach students and what are they looking for in a quicker time frame? Yeah, and I think, you know, recognizing our, our individual campus context to our student populations are, and I'll just, you know, bring back to our program context. So we're, we're a program that attracts students, you know, we have some GPA requirements as part of it. It is that curricular piece. So we have students that are entering college with significant, especially in engineering, um, with significant AP credit. And we have students sometimes that, I mean, I had a student, a, a freshman that I met this year, came into school with 45 credits, 45 credits. Oh. Like, did you have a childhood? <laughs> <laughs> or were you studying all, all the time? But but thinking about, right, like, what does that mean? We, we appreciate this, this four-year time of transition, but I think even more so, um, and I don't know that this is just COVID related. I think it, there's a lot of other factors at play related to that early graduation, but I think generationally, this may be something in pockets of students um, mm -hmm. that we see. But yeah, we also yeah. may see other students who are taking more time. Um, and so how do we create flexible systems that are going to enable us to respond um, with it agilely um, right. to those different needs? Great, great. Seeing great. just a couple, of, yeah, go ahead, Vernon, yeah. Well, I was thinking too, I mean, as you were talking about sort of, um, I, you kind of moved into some academic pieces and I'm thinking about study abroad and internships and the impact of, of students maybe not being able, I think when you mentioned um, uh, during the pandemic, really not having support from faculty and staff and mentors, I think a part of that too is not being able to be on internships um, or their internships are virtual, which means they're not having the experience they would have, and nobody was studying abroad. And now, will a group of students not be, will, will we have a generation of students that don't have a study abroad experience, or at least the opportunity to do one? Um, so anyway, just thinking through that. Yeah, I mean, I think what what all of these trends, I think, are pointing to, and, and maybe this is a way for us to summarize this, is some of the experiences and opportunities that, again, we're maybe sort of baked into our assumptions. I'm looking back to a comment um, that Kelsey made earlier around, like, assumptions of what students have experienced or what they're coming in knowing or having navigated. Um, like, it's not the same. And so our starting point um, might be a little bit different. And, and when we think about you know, experiences like study abroad, experiences like professional work experience where you have to show up on time and, you know, <laughs> secure an opportunity, right? Like some of those experiences are where we learn and we face and encounter those, those opportunities for adversity where we can build that resilience. And some of our students just haven't had that. Nick, I think this is sort of what you were alluding to in the beginning, right? Is that just some of those life experiences 
um, that you have in early in emerging adulthood, um, you just haven't had. And so, um, you know, we just might be encountering them developmentally a little bit earlier than what we're used to um, in, in different pockets. And I just want to acknowledge, like I'm making assumptions about different populations of students, and this may or may not be true um, across all, but in, in a wide variety of the students that we have seen. Um, if there's other trends, oh, Bonnie, please go ahead. Hi, yeah, I just wanted to hop in. I have some extra context because I actually graduated past May in 2022 um, and was supposed to graduate in 2023 this year. So I was one of those early grads. Um, and I think something that's definitely interesting is sort of the, and maybe animosity isn't the right word, but maybe some animosity between the Bonnie, I think we lost your audio. Um, coming, a hard time hearing you. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes, much better. Oh, Thank you. so sorry about that. Um, I think animosity isn't exactly the right word, but some sort of tension between classes of, oh, I my college experience got cut short, um, or and some others who like are maybe you don't like understand what we went through because COVID came while we were in high school, and so th I think there's a lot of misunderstanding, um, which is also leading to the um, misconnection between peers, for sure. Yeah, and Bonnie, do you think that as you're thinking about that, is the that connection maybe between students and um, us adults or older folks who have been part yeah. of experiences and seen it, is that the relationship that you're pointing to? Yeah, definitely. I think too, at least in my experience, a lot of administrators um, maybe didn't maybe didn't quite understand the fact that our 18 to 22 year old experience had completely changed. And so the expectations to be socially adaptable and have all of those skills and training that we didn't get to have, like for example, a study abroad experience is super important. We didn't have that opportunity to be able to do that. And so, but the expectation to still have that experience is still there. So yeah, I think, I think there's definitely some tension in that right as well. I'm so grateful that you shared that experience and that perspective. I think it just lends so much, um, so many reminders, right, to all of us of, um, and, and this will point as we get into some of these other themes and, and trends, um, thinking about like, how do we build connection and trust in meaningful ways with student populations so that that, um, whether they're assumptions or experienced uh, moments um, are true that we can can kind of get there and address that. So Bonnie, thank you so much for, for sharing that experience. Um, I'll just kind of high level talk through some of the things that, that I think this points to. Um, the, the social fabric of our campuses is fundamentally different, right? So that goes back to there weren't returning RAs to help mentor, right? There weren't uh, return um, student organization officer transitions that were happening. But I think, Bonnie, you just like hit the nail on the head related to that in terms of the, the trust and the connection, I think, between faculty and staff on campus and, and a student experience. And so um, sort of a, a moment for us to think about, gosh, what, what do we do about that? If we, if we really are wanting to build that resilient capacity, um, how do we bridge the gap of connection that may exist? On the call with Ben on Monday, the 23rd, um, a gentleman named J uh, Jeremy, I think it was, um, made a comment that our scaffolding is insufficient. So to me, um, what this, you know, th those historically appropriate patterns of relating, of working, assuming about experiences um, based on, you know, pre student predecessors, those patterns just don't exist. And so what we know how to do, we have to fundamentally get curious um, and be really committed. And, and I'll go back to that grounding and gratitude that we get to be part of this journey. Maybe the journey looks a little bit different for our students and we have to get curious and meet them where they are um, rather than meeting them where we expect them to be. Um, and and I, I will say like, this is me saying that out loud as a reminder to myself, right? That sometimes we want our students to be um, at a place where they just life experience has prepared them to be. And so we have to pause and check our own assumptions um, about what we are looking for. And then, um, you know, I mentioned Ben, Ben was a colleague um, of mine during the pandemic, we were talking and thinking a lot about how can we take some personal responsibility for changing the environment 
for um, not just leaving that uh, resilience building up to individual students, but how can to figure it out, but how can we take some responsibility to wade into it with them um, and to create opportunities for connection. Um, you know, how, how, how do we do that? Um, and so I'm gonna just share a couple of things that in the course of um, the last couple of years, we have made some really intentional commitments to try to, um, try to change um, in the course of our programming. Um, and my invitation is there, please share your experience as well. Um, but we really tried to ground ourselves in our own, in the worldview, right? And to recognize that our lens is just one lens. And so how were we personally practicing gratitude and then practicing compassion with our students and meeting them where they were, and then really focusing our efforts on building positive and meaningful relationships and social connection. And I actually um, am reminded that this is, I think now more important than ever, right? It felt necessary and important during the pandemic through disconnection. Um, but I think it's more important now than ever. And I think Bonnie highlighted very beautifully through her personal experience, um, you know, why, why that's important. So some things that we did um, connected to that worldview. So us taking a collective effort, um, trying to help create that individual impact, um, regularly helping people reframe their context, that pause for breath that we did at the beginning, right? Recognizing our feet are on the ground, inviting our students to kind of recalibrate their mindset, um, why they were here in college in the first place, right? What do they hope to get out of the experience Then, how are they approaching their learning? Um, you know, increasingly, and I don't know if this is, I don't think this is pandemic related. I, I think that this is just kind of a, a, a broader societal trend and maybe a future topic for, for another webinar, but um, just a, a shift in how students are approaching their learning. So not necessarily with curiosity, um, but with, do I have the right answer? And so how are we inviting students to a, 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 a way of learning that is curious, that will allow them to look at and encounter failure and challenge and adversity with curiosity um, as an opportunity to learn. So recalibrating, um, we did that, we, we still do that. Beginning of every class period, we take two minutes for breath and we have a series of prompts um, that we ask our students to remember why they're there and to think about how they are approaching their learning. Doing a lot, reframing our experiences, thinking about challenge and failure and adversity as opportunities to learn, and that these are the things that become our, our assets. These are the things that become our superpowers because we've learned to navigate them. Um, and so working with students regularly on that reframing of experience. Um, and then really as a staff, changing our context. So rather than only focusing on accountability while well, they didn't do the work, um, when a student is, has the courage to ask for help, um, being willing to be flexible with them, but to live in the tension, right? And the, there's a time for accountability, there's a time for grace, and that, that's a very gray space in between, um, but really leaning into that um, with our students and inviting them into conversation about um, what they think would be appropriate. I've talked a lot about social fabric and strengthening the, the connection, but we've done a lot of work around our campus, um, trying to build relationships staff to staff, colleague to colleague, um, so that we can share our experiences and invite other people um, into this partnership and work, building our relationship with our students, but probably most importantly, inviting students into personal, uh, meaningful personal connection and vulnerable relationship with one another, um, which is a hugely important part of building that capacity, sharing their story helping people hear and learn um, about what others have been through. And then we've been looking at our structure. Um, and I think this goes back to the conversation around early graduation. It goes around to like financial considerations, right? Um, with the spirit that whatever we did yesterday, the structure that made sense yesterday um, might not make sense today. And how can we do better? So looking, re-examining time commitments of our programs, um, connecting to existing incentives. So looking at our courses, what can count towards our core of common studies where it used to be above and beyond? Um, how do we incentivize students differently? Differently. How do we shape and talk about paid professional experiences, which is a required component um, that students have a professional experience to be able to reflect on? How do we help them shape like, listen, you can do this program and make meaning and, and work and, and um, have an opportunity to make money at the same time? Um, and then really digging into the unique experiences of different, different populations of students, both on our campus and in our program, and trying to understand how those have shifted and are different um, over, over time. Um, 
So I know we're kind of coming up at the point in time, Vernon and I said we wanted to maybe begin to wrap up our, our conversation here at about 10 to the hour, but I'm just curious then again, you know, if you're most comfortable in the chat, that would be just fine. If you want to come off mute, that is great. But what are you doing to build your own resilience? And, and, and I, maybe the, the language here is, how are you attending to the, your own capacity to build resilience? How are you attending to that capacity building with your students? And I think at the broader context or system level, what are we doing to change our environments and our communities um, so that we create space for people to build that capacity? I don't know if there's any, any suggestions, ideas that, that folks wanna offer um, here in our closing moments. As folks are popping things in the chat or getting ready to come off mute. I was thinking about just this whole culture of plow through um, that we do um, on our college campuses. Like we didn't, we just kind of came back. There was no acknowledgement, as you mentioned, of all of the grief, loss, anything. It was just, okay, we're back, let's go. Because that's the culture specifically within academia of let's just move forward. Let's just plow through. And I love the fact that um, you're talking about how can we, not only at the very beginning, which is starting off with pausing, but just the fact that what are structurally happening in our programs that may be um, uh, enabling that sort of that sort of mentality around, we don't care that you struggled. It's all about now. Right, right. I think Vernon, it's, I think it's, it's not unique to higher ed. Um, I think, you know, I have two sisters that work in healthcare um, yeah. and you want to talk about another community that really people, I mean, the burnout that is, that's being experienced by our, our healthcare professionals um, mm -hmm. and just, you know, you just have to keep going. You just have to keep going and not that collective pause to grieve what they witnessed, what they held, what they experienced. Um, and we did that, right? As a, as a society, we all, we all grieve. That was a, a collective trauma. Um, and how do we, how do we pause and acknowledge that and, and create space for people to arrive as they are with what they've experienced, um, because that is who they are. Kelsey, um, recognizing and practicing having boundaries, allowing students to have boundaries and giving students space to share, open up and being okay with enough. Yeah, right, like honoring when a student is putting up those boundaries and making a decision that's the best for their time. It might be disappointing to us, it might hurt our numbers for participation, but those are those are important choices that they're they're doing that, so. Yeah, noticing for signs, right? When when they may be um, stop responding and stop engaging mm -hmm. with us. So great. Well, well I'm, I'm, go, go ahead, Jordan. Just one quick thing. I think too that that students <clears throat> confuse the plow through mentality with resilience. Mm. I believe wow. that they that they're being resilient when they're just plowing through. And we need to change that narrative. We need to help them navigate that narrative in terms of just because you've plowed through doesn't mean it didn't affect you um so absolutely absolutely so well said so well said bonnie bonnie go ahead so sorry to take up more time um but just wanted to share something that was super helpful for me and my journey of starting to work with students was a colleague of mine shared the movie versus book metaphor whereas those of us who were in the college space previous to COVID, we keep telling our students the movie version of things, the way that we saw things, um, but we kind of have to let them read the book first and create their own story and experience um, and allow for them to shape that um, because it, it doesn't look the same as it did pre-2020. And so giving them the space to redefine what the college experience means for them, what the organization experience means for them, um, I think is key to both for us as, you know, leaders of their organizations working with them and then also helping them build some resilience and realizing that it doesn't need to look the way that it did before. Gosh, so what a beautiful metaphor, right, to invite us all into. And Kat, I'm seeing your compassion clause in your syllabus, right? Um, and, and talking about it in length. Yeah, that's it. That's part of our learning philosophy, right, is we care about you as a person first. Um, and so if there's stuff going on, we want to talk and we want to know, we want to partner. Um, Oh my gosh, they're craving that vulnerability that, that you're talking about. So this, this offering of ourselves and our own experience, and sometimes just watching us be able to name and talk through. Um, some students don't have a model for that. Um, and because of that sort of plow through mentality that a lot of us um, 
that kind of embraced. So gosh, um, great, great suggestions. Um, great suggestions coming through here. So I'm deeply grateful for the engagement um, the, of, of this group today and um, really happy to, to engage in further conversation offline um, if, if anyone would like to. Um, but, but please, uh, just an invitation to be present, uh, to build relationship, to lean into conversation with our students. Um, and, and Bonnie, just a reminder to me, right? Like we just, we can't hold on to, to the experiences that we knew, right? And we have to learn from our students about how they are. Um, I, I just am thinking about what are the images and the, the metaphors and how the story that they're, they're seeing unfold um, in their book version. Um, what a beautiful, beautiful metaphor and a great place for us to end. So thank you all so much. Well, thanks so much, Kate, for, uh, for being here. What a perfect, perfect, perfect end to our series in terms of thinking about um, the impact of multiple pandemics on our students and our communities. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I, I would be remiss if I did not um, do a little commercial and let you know that we do have programs, specifically, actually, a program for students and for professional staff on resilience. Um, and so we can tell you more about that if you, if you would like that. And also to... Catalyst, our program, which is our one-day program, the Institute, which is our four-day experience, and Courageous Dialogue, <clears throat> which is currently a, a virtual experience. Um, um, one, something that's not here is um, our um, new program, which we will be rolling out pretty soon. Um, it's We've been sort of um, doing um, pilots on different campuses, and that's um, living with living and impossible, living um, with possibility, um, because I think it's important for us to um, uh, we we were given uh, we were actually asked to do to develop something that was sort of a weekend program um, for retreats and so um, living in possibility is that um, oh and also too we're we're bringing national sessions back so if you would like to send students to a national session we will have one this year in May in Boston so <clears throat> we're so excited to be bringing back the national sessions and so please um, let us know if you would like to send students to our our first national sessions in three years. Um, Always to, as as most of you know, we're a not-for-profit, and if you are able and you would love to donate to allow for us to send students um, at a reduced cost to our um, to our national session and also to some of our other programs, please, um, yeah, send us some money. Thank you. Um, we'd love to have it. Um, we'll take it. Um, and thank you all for spending some time um, with us today. Thanks again, Kate, for joining us. And if you need anything for us, let us know. We hope to be back with another series soon. We know that the higher education conference season is getting ready to heat up. So you'll hear from us as soon as we find a window where we can have some more conversations. So thanks again. Have a good day.